Good evening. There's less, nothing like a good evening to quiet the crowd. Thank you. Welcome, everybody. My name is Peter Reiling from the Aspen Institute, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's events. Over the past 24 hours and on into the night, uh, 363 of the world's most talented, committed leaders in business, government, and civil society from 35 countries have been landing here in Aspen uh, for tomorrow's formal launch of the Resnick Aspen Action Forum, the inaugural Resnick Aspen Action Forum. This is an annual event that's been secured with the largest gift in the history of the Aspen Institute by the Resnick Family Foundation, Linda and Stuart, thank you so much. The Action Forum is designed, as the name implies, not for people to come together to produce white papers or to give speeches, but to act, to address some of the greatest challenges in our times. The Forum this year has a theme of leading toward justice. What a time to be talking about this theme, not just here in the United States, but frankly, around the world. We had a soft launch this morning, um, because we spent the day with three concurrent work sessions that we called deep dives. Uh, we've had feedback in the past as we've run these events from our fellows who come in from around the world saying there are certain issues that we can't really just deal with in 90 minutes, which tends to be the average length of our sessions. We'd love a full day to de take a deeper dive to figure out how later we're going to collaborate and what each of us might do in the future. One of them today was sponsored by the Skoll Foundation. It was focused on leading systemic change. We had a second one that was sponsored by friends from Care.com, Dell, and Workday on the future of talent and work. And a third one, a very powerful one, on race in America. I had the chance over the course of the day to float across the three of these events, and I know that they were not just powerful, but productive. They were designed to make sure that we didn't leave just feeling good or feeling uneasy, for that matter, but committed to distinctive actions, and each of them has led to actions. We're going to continue today with, uh, uh, I hope it'll be a fun event, and I'm sure will be a fun event. It'll be a talk by my fellow Baltimorean, David Rubenstein, uh, also a major sponsor of the Action Forum, but I should also say a sponsor of our groundbreaking work in China with our China Leadership Program. That'll be followed on stage by a conversation uh, with my friend and, and fellow Henry Crown Fellow and uh, Executive Vice President at the Aspen Institute, Eric Motley, who I somehow believe every person in this room already knows. It'll be on the theme of the Ark of Justice, the 13th Amendment, then and now, case in point right up here. After this, we're going to screen with thanks to the Skoll Foundation, a film by Davis Guggenheim called He Named Me Malala, followed by a discussion on empowering women and girls with a cross-section of our fellows from around the world, uh, and that'll be our evening. David Rubenstein is certainly no stranger to all of you. He's been out in Aspen very frequently and most recently for the Aspen Ideas Festival, unless, David, you've been out here since. I don't think so. Um, he's an, an amazing speaker, as we'll see, on an incredible range of topics. David is, of course, the co-founder and the co-CEO of the Carlisle Group, uh, a world leader in private equity. He's chairman of the Kennedy Center. Um, but he's perhaps best known these days, I think, as a pioneer in patriotic philanthropy. How many people, after all, can be credited with the repairs of Mount Vernon, Monticello, Montpellier, the Washington Monument, among others, and how many can be credited with owning the original copies, original copies of Magna Carta, the Declaration of Independence, the Emancipation Proclamation, and of importance to us tonight, the 13th Amendment. Ladies and gentlemen, David Rubenstein. Thank you very much, Peter, and thank you all for coming. Um, how many are, are from the United States, people here? How many are from outside? Okay, wow, okay. Um, when the first ships came to the United States to bring settlers, Mayflower, the Jamestown uh, settlement, 
Uh, it wasn't expected at that time that the United States would turn out to be the most powerful country in the world, the envy of the world, the greatest economic power, the greatest political power, the greatest military power. But um, it did turn out to be that case. But from the time of, I would say, about 100 years from the time that those first ships came over, uh, this country has suffered from one uh, overarching problem, and that's the problem that stemmed from uh, slavery. Uh, it became the greatest political, economic, moral, and social issue of our country. And today, the events that we're seeing in our country today are really manifestations of the after effects of slavery. How did we actually become a slavery country? Well, it's not what was originally intended. When Jamestown, which was probably the first settlement in the United States, was first settled, there was no intention to have slavery. In fact, the English settlers didn't really believe in slavery. England did not have slavery. What happened was there was slavery in other parts of the world, and for thousands of years there were, there were slaves throughout much of the world. Uh, it wasn't an uncommon thing to have slavery, but England didn't have it. And uh, really, in the Western world, slavery was prevalent, but it was prevalent really in the Caribbean and down in Latin America. The Spanish and the Dutch and others uh, brought slaves from Africa there, but there really wasn't an intention by the English to have slavery in this country. What happened was, by happenstance, a ship that was a uh, Spanish ship heading towards Latin America was taken over by the Dutch, and the Dutch ultimately brought that ship to Jamestown, and they had uh, about 20 um, slaves on it. Now, in the English-speaking world and the Spanish uh, world, if you were a slave um, and you had been baptized, you really couldn't continue to be a slave. These uh, uh, Spanish, uh, these, these um, Africans had been baptized. The Dutch didn't think that if you were baptized, you were uh, still free to, uh, to be a free person. You could still be a slave. But the Spanish had the view that once you're baptized, you couldn't be a slave anymore. And so when these um, 20 or so um, people came to, to Jamestown, the ship went to Jamestown, the Dutch shipmaster took it there, uh, they were taken in as indentured servants. Indentured servitude was very common in England and very common in the colonies because in the colonies what happened was to, to fill the labor force, uh, England would send over indentured servants. Indentured servants were people that didn't have money, they couldn't get jobs, they had maybe legal problems, and they were brought over to work three, four, five, seven years, whatever it would be, and then they were freed. And so these uh, first slaves, so-called, were really indentured servants. The first Africans in this uh, country were really indentured servants, and they served as, as, as indentured servants. One of the descendants of them, probably a man named John Punch, in 1640 was found to have violated the law in Jamestown, and he was made a slave, the first real slave. And then uh, other slave ships were ultimately brought to the United States, or the colonies, and it was not all that frequent, though. In the early 1600s, we didn't really need that many workers because indentured servants were coming over from England and indentured servants were really providing the, the workforce needs. And so it wasn't really until the latter part of the 1600s, around 1680, when finally England's economy was recovering and people there didn't really need to come to the United States as indentured servants. So to get the labor force uh, that was needed, the English began to uh, bring slaves to the United States. They were then controlling much more than they had before the passageway from Africa to the, United, to the colonies. And so the English authorized and, they, and, and, and facilitated the bringing over of slaves. And a lot of the slave uh, uh, operations were run out of England, even though slavery wasn't legal in England. So slaves were brought over. And interestingly, over the time that slaves were brought to the Western world, roughly 10 to 11 million slaves were brought to the Western world. But only about 6% uh, of them were actually brought to the United States or the colonies because most of the slaves were actually sent to the Caribbean, which had intensive needs for slavery, and, 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 um, and the Latin American. And why was that? Well, that was because the, uh, the, the diseases in the tropical areas and the labor involved was so intense, the food supply wasn't that good, the medical treatment was terrible, that the slaves that went to the Caribbean area and the Latin American area died off relatively quickly and so they had to replenish them very, relatively quickly. The United States has, uh, what was, became the United States had roughly about 600 to maybe 650,000 slaves brought here over the period of uh, the entire history. Uh, so about 6% of all the slaves brought to the, West, the Western world. Um, we had at the time of the revolution about, uh, in, in our country, about, uh, I, I'd say, uh, in the revolution, about 500,000 slaves. At the time of the Civil War, we had roughly 4 million slaves. How did we have so many? Well, the slaves that came here 
um, reproduced, it was healthier, we had more female slaves, for a variety of reasons, uh, we, we, we had more slaves born here than was born in Latin America and, and, uh, and in the Caribbean area. And so, um, after 1680, as we began to need more labor workforce for the agricultural system that we had, and America was basically an agricultural economy, we began to import more and more slaves. And they were imported mostly, uh, slavery was legal in every state, and every state had slaves. Uh, it wasn't considered immoral uh, by most of the population. Abolitionists didn't arise until 1830 or so. And so really, it was considered part of uh, our system, of country, uh, the system of our economic system. Now, the slaves were used much more in the agricultural areas, but slaves were used as servants in the north. They were used for, um, as, as apprentices, labor, and other kinds of things. They had some skilled trades, but they were still slaves. In the south, the middle part of the South, the, 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 Midwest, the, Mid -East, the uh, middle states, uh, Maryland, Virginia, and so forth, Delaware, they were used for agricultural purposes, and they were in the South Carolina and North Carolina and Georgia as well. And then uh, gradually it became more and more accepted. So what happened was uh, we decided to, to, to become independent of uh, Great Britain. We, we had the Declaration of Independence that declared why we wanted to be free. And Thomas Jefferson, who wrote that, famously wrote, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. All men are created equal. Now, how could a man write that when he had two slaves with him and he owned about 200 slaves? How did he do that? Well, Thomas Jefferson initially, as a young man, thought that slavery was immoral. He tried as a young politician to kind of get the slaves to, to, to be taken away from Virginia and they sent west outside of, uh, of west of, of Virginia, but he, that got no support and he gave up that, and as his political career moved forward, he gave up the idea of ab abolishing slavery. But he did have the view that, that everybody is born free, but they can't live together as free men. And so that was a kind of a complicated uh, uh, way that he justified his view that all men are created equal, they just can't live together as free people. Uh, that was his view, and that was a very common view, a very common view. That, and it was very common to view that, uh, that African slaves were not the same in terms of their intellectual abilities, their other moral qualities as, as white Americans. That was their very common view, and Jefferson had it. Um, so when he wrote that, um, people in the, uh, in the Continental Congress didn't laugh at it. They didn't laugh. They understood what he meant. He didn't really mean that blacks and whites were going to live together as equal. But when King George uh, prepared a response, he had some... Uh, responses prepared in effect for the British government, they never officially responded to the Declaration of Independence, their response kind of said, how can you say this, all men are created equal when you have slaves? But one third of the people at the Continental Congress were, who approved the Declaration of Independence were slave owners. And in fact, uh, nine of the first 12 presidents of the United States were slave owners. In fact, for of the, 60, of the first 65 years of our country's history, 41 of those or so were, or about 40, 49 of the 65 were uh, years that the presidents of the United States had been slave owners. So it was a very common thing. Um, but it was clear that they didn't really want to deal with slavery, and it became more and more important to the country uh, in the latter part of the 1700s and the early part of the 1800s, because tobacco was an important crop that, was, that slaves were used for in, in Virginia and Maryland and in North Carolina, but it had some problems. The soil ultimately couldn't be kept, used forever for that, and it didn't require the intensive amount of slave work that you needed for something called cotton. And when the cotton gin was invented by Eli Whitney, it made it much uh, easier for uh, us to grow cotton in the United States. And cotton became not only our biggest export, but in the, in the uh, war, years leading up to the Civil War, cotton was the biggest export by so far that all the other exports added together didn't equal what cotton was in this country. And in England began to be the biggest consumer of cotton because they had mills and other things that weave the cotton into cloth and other things. So cotton required a lot of, a lot of work, and work in the fields was very diff difficult. So two bad things happened. One, more and more slaves were brought in to, to feed the needs for the cotton workers, the cotton fields. And secondly, there was a mass migration from the middle part of the United States down to the deep south, because the need for slaves in the middle part of the country wasn't quite as intense as it was in the deep south. So you had a million slaves going down to the deep south, and they were uprooted from their families. Just as slaves had been uprooted from Africa and brought over, families were disrupted, the same thing happened in the United States around the time that the cotton became such a prevalent part of our society. So, you go forward, cotton is the king, 
Uh, the, the South is really dependent on a, on a slave-based system. The United, in the northern part of the United States, it became less important, though slavery wasn't outlawed in all the states. It, there were still slaves. So what happens? We get to the, uh, the situation where Abraham Lincoln is elected president of the United States. And it was, there was a fear in the South that he would do something that had not been thought possible before, that he would eliminate slavery not only in the western states, but in the southern states. And let me explain what I mean. Uh, in 1820, there had been a compromise that outside of the original colonies, uh, when Missouri came into the state, the United States, it would, be, it would be a slave state. And in return for that, the compromise was that Maine would be not slave state. North of Missouri, everything else in the Louisiana Purchase was to be slave free. That was the so-called Missouri Compromise of 1820. But around 1850, there was a, a different uh, compromise that undid the Missouri Compromise. And what happened was Stephen Douglas, later famous for running against uh, Abraham Lincoln, he proposed in Congress and passed uh, a legislation that said that, that new states coming in, Nebraska and Kansas specifically, they would have the right to vote on whether they wanted to be slave states or not. In other words, they wouldn't be prohibited, as the Missouri Compromise had said. Well, that was very controversial. Abraham Lincoln thought that was in, in, improper. He said, we had a deal, the Missouri Compromise, slaves, uh, slave states weren't supposed to be added beyond Missouri. And so the, the fight was really this. The slave states felt that if we didn't have slavery in the western states, eventually the slave states would be the southern states and they would get outvoted in Congress because all the new states would be slave free. Uh, the, the states that didn't want slavery recognized the same thing. They didn't want slavery in the other states because they realized if all the new states come in the western territories, eventually slavery will die out. And it was the view of people in the north and in other parts of the United States that eventually slavery would die out of its own uh, economic inefficiencies. So when Abraham Lincoln was elected, because he had been against letting slavery go in the western states, uh, the southern states seceded. And they basically said, we are going to secede from the Union because we believe not only are you against having slavery um, in, the new, in the western states, but you will eventually get rid of slavery in the southern states. Abraham Lincoln didn't actually have that view. Amazingly, Abraham Lincoln's view was slavery was part of the Constitution, and I can't undo the Constitution. And in fact, this is hard to believe, but his predecessor, James Buchanan, had a constitutional amendment that was approved by Congress, not actually ratified, but to, approved by two-thirds of each House of, of the members of, uh, of the Senate and the House that said that slavery is part of our country's system and it is not to be changed. That was originally to be the 13th Amendment. Abraham Lincoln, in his first inaugural address, supported that. He supported that because his view was the Constitution said there's slavery in effect in the, in the, uh, in the United States, it was permitted, Eventually, uh, Abraham Lincoln thought he would die out, but he didn't think he had the right to change it. Okay, so the southern states secede, we go to the Civil War. The Civil War was thought to be uh, a dance for the, uh, and a party for the northern states. The northern states were three times as big, three times as much wealth, three times as many people, three times as many soldiers. So, and the first battle of Bull Run in Virginia, uh, a lot of the northerners come down to sit on their lounge chairs and watch the southerners get, get clobbered, and it turns out the southerners beat the northerners. And so people realized, hey, this may not be such an easy cakewalk. And it turned out that it took a long, long time uh, to make any progress. Lincoln was very uh, upset about what to do. He didn't really know whether he could win the war or not. But he said repeatedly, my job is to hold the Union together. It is not to free the slaves. And while he was pressured by abolitionists who had risen in the 1830s and 1840s and 1850s to saying it's immoral to eliminate, to have slavery, he didn't ever actually agree to that. His view was to hold the Union together. But gradually, he began to ha have the view that he couldn't win the Civil War if the slaves were still fighting uh, against the North because they were the economic machinery behind the South. In other words, the Southern slaves were doing a lot of the work that enabled Southern uh, white men to go fight in the war. So they were doing, providing a lot of the economic uh, power uh, for the South. And so eventually, he came up with a view that he had to do something to eliminate slavery. But since he didn't think he had the right under the Constitution to eliminate slavery, he came up with an artifice that may not have uh, succeeded in the Supreme Court, but it was never challenged. And it was this, I'm the commander in chief. And as the commander in chief, I have war powers. And one of my war powers is to do things that are necessary to win the war. Well, I'm gonna declare that slaves are, are now to be freed in all the states that are fighting against the United States. So I'm gonna issue something called the Emancipation Proclamation. He talked about this with his cabinet 
in July of 1862, and they said, wait a second, don't do that, because a lot of the Northerners are fighting to hold the Union together. They're not fighting to make the slaves free, and you'll scare a lot of the Northerners. Secondly, uh, it'll make the Southerners fight even harder, because they'll realize that slavery will be eliminated if we, they lose the war, and therefore they have an incentive to fight even harder, so don't do this. But Lincoln decided it was the best way to, to weaken the Southern military position. As it turns out, um, he ultimately agreed to, that he would hold it off for a while because uh, one of his cabinet officers, um, Mr. Seward, the Secretary of State, said, don't issue the Emancipation Proclamation as a sign of weakness. We've just lost a couple battles. Let's win something, and so we can do it as a position of strength. So in the Battle of Antietam, uh, the South was driven back from Maryland. They were driven back uh, from the North, and so that was taken as the good enough sign to issue uh, the preliminary uh, Emancipation Proclamation, which was issued on September 22nd, 1862. And Lincoln said then, within 100 days, or on January 1 of 1863, I'll issue a permanent um, Emancipation Proclamation of freeing all the slaves in the states that are fighting against the North. Now, if you are in a, a, a border state, which would be Missouri, Delaware, uh, Kentucky, and Maryland, you are not fighting against the United States, so I'm not a commander-in-chief who's fighting against you, so the slaves in those states would stay as slaves. This seems bizarre, but that's that the reasoning he had, because he was using his military powers, and he wasn't fighting this, the, the, the uh, border states. Now, the border states, he tried to get them to give up their slaves many times, and they wouldn't do it. He, he, Lincoln had a view from one time he was a member of Congress in the early, uh, in the 1840s, uh, and it was a Whig, uh, he was a Whig member of Congress. He had proposed at that time that slavery be eliminated from the District of Columbia, but Lincoln's view all, of, all along had been slavery should be eliminated on, on a gradual basis with the consent of the slave owners. The slave owners are to be compensated, and then there's to be colonization. Colonization was a euphemism for all the slaves are to be taken out of the country and shipped elsewhere. And even as President of the United States, he spent a lot of time trying to convince African uh, Americans that they should leave the country. He had a delegation of prominent African Americans come to the United States, to come to the White House at one point, and convince them that there was some place in Panama that they should go to, and they said to him afterwards, what are you, crazy? I mean, we've been in this country longer than you've been here, we're not leaving. But that was his view. Colonization was a very common uh, um, uh, idea at the time. Even abolitionists, even abolitionists who didn't think that slavery was moral, felt that, slave, that blacks and whites could not live together, that whites would take, slave, would take jobs from the blacks would take slave jobs from, from the whites, and as a result, uh, even abolitionists were not really in favor of having blacks live side by side with whites, let alone have rights to vote and other kinds of uh, civil rights. So um, Lincoln decided that the only way he could win the war was the Emancipation Proclamation. He did issue it on January 1 of 1863. And uh, at the time he was, did it, he, he, uh, it was a very common in those days, on January 1, people would come into the White House to shake the hand of the president. He shook 2,500 hands that day. He went upstairs to sign the, the Emancipation Proclamation, and his hand was shaking. And he couldn't quite pick up the pen, and many people said that meant he really didn't really believe he should sign it. But ultimately, he signed it. He waited his hand calm down. He didn't want it to look like it was, uh, he was uncertain about what he's doing. He signed it. And the reaction was predictable, uh, although he had indicated he was going to do this. Uh, people in the North thought that this was not necessarily a good thing because it would mean two things. One, ultimately, slaves who were freed would come to the North and take jobs. That wasn't something that they really wanted. Secondly, the Southerners were going to fight even harder, and some Southerners would. Uh, whites would fight harder. But it had one other effect that he didn't in completely anticipate. Many states, uh, many foreign countries, Britain and, and France in particular, were thinking of coming in to support the, uh, the South in the war, but because they were against slavery, they no longer thought if Lincoln was against uh, uh, slavery and was going to free the slaves, they couldn't any longer credibly um, do, 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 the, do the support of the South. So it eliminated the, the Southern support, potentially, of, of foreign states. Ultimately, it didn't, have the pro it didn't solve the problem overnight, uh, and it didn't solve the problem of slavery, because all Lincoln said was, if you are a slave, you are freed if you are um, in, a state, uh, in, a, in a state which is what, one of the ones that we're fighting against. But if you are in a state like the, uh, the uh, border states, you're not freed. If you're certain states or certain areas controlled by the unions, you're not freed because we control you. So it only freed probably a few slaves. Some people say it only freed 20 to 30,000 slaves immediately. But it did have the effect that when slaves who were 
um, controlled by slave owners. When they heard about this, they did try to escape, and more and more slaves did escape. And Lincoln also, in his, in his Emancipation Proclamation, said that, that blacks who did, were freed could fight for the unions. And ultimately, 200,000 freed slaves did fight for the union. Uh, this, the, the Confederates didn't want to use slaves, obviously, in the military, and they didn't want to arm them. Not until the last, last month of the war did they actually do that. So anyway, Lincoln uh, Emancipation Proclamation didn't overnight change the war, but it did give some power to the, uh, to the North, and ultimately the war went on for quite a while. It didn't end until uh, April of 1865. But here's the problem that arose. As the war was moving forward, as the war was moving forward, it was clear that Link, the North would probably win. After Gettysburg, which occurred in July 1 to July 4 of 1863, after the Battle of Gettysburg, when Lee had to come back from Gettysburg, go, go back into the South, and the North really won that war and that battle, uh, it became clear that eventually the North was going to win. And so people began saying, what are we going to do with the slaves then? Because the slaves who've been freed in the southern states, well, are they, what status do they have in the future if the, if the war is over? And what about the slaves in the border states? What about the slaves who live in the north? Uh, and what are we going to do with all these slaves? And how are they going to be freed? Well, Lincoln was, had a different plan, and he wasn't quite clear about what he really wanted to do. But ultimately, his plan was to have each of the southern states uh, adopt, set up a new legislature. The new legislature would abolish slavery, and therefore there would be no slavery in the southern states, and everything would be fine. And uh, he, all he said was 10% of the voters in each state uh, would, would have to vote for a new legislature, and they'd have to vote for a constitution that would eliminate slavery. Um, obviously, a lot of the southern states didn't want to agree to that, though some, a few did. But the problem was that uh, it really wasn't going to solve the problem of the border states. So ultimately, um, some people in Congress proposed that we have an amendment to the Constitution eliminating slavery, and that would have been the 13th Amendment. The 12th Amendment had been many, many years ago. We hadn't amended the Constitution in about 70 years. So Lincoln didn't really think amending the Constitution was a good idea because he viewed the Constitution as sacred, and you just don't amend it. It's a sacred body given to us by the founding uh, fathers. So he really didn't support it, and so it was actually, without his support, the 13th Amendment passed in uh, the Congress in, 1860, in 1863, uh, it, it, it passed the, the Senate. The Senate passed it, but it went to the House and it was defeated. So um, what happened was nothing was really done. It was defeated in the House, and then they go forward to the, to the 1864 elections. Lincoln actually never supported the, the 13th Amendment when it was in the House, in the Senate, honestly, and in the House because he didn't think it was that politically popular. He thought it might hurt him for the 1864 re-election, and there were a lot of people in the North who really didn't want to eliminate slavery in quite the way that, an that, that, that a uh, constitutional amendment would do so. So he, he kind of played it both ways. He said he wanted to continue fighting the war. The Emancipation Proclamation was adequate. Each of the southern states would, would change their, their constitution and their legislature, and that's what Lincoln's position was. When the 1864 Republican Convention came around, ultimately he was pressured to agree that the Republican platform would say, yes, he favor, it favors the 13th Amendment. So Lincoln eventually uh, came out in favor of the uh, 13th Amendment uh, right before the re-election, but he didn't really talk much about it. After the re-election, he then said, okay, I want to get this 13th Amendment passed. Now, why did he want to do it after the re-election? Why did he not want to do it before? Well, there was political problems before, perhaps. He wasn't sure that it was going to make him that popular in the North. There were a lot of people in the North who said, Lincoln just wants to free the slaves, and it's going to be a disaster for the North economically. So he didn't really, wasn't a profile in courage right before the election. He modestly supported it. But afterwards, he wanted to support it. But why did he want to support it afterwards? Because the 1864 election was a gigantic victory for the Republicans. And so when the next Congress came in, he'd have enough votes to overwhelmingly get the, thir the 13th Amendment through the Senate, and the Senate and the House, already passed the Senate, but he had enough votes to get it through the House. But why did he want to do it in the lame duck session? And the lame duck session was different then. The elections were held in November. The new Congress came in in March, um, but technically it came in in March, but they didn't really meet until December. So you had a long time to go before the new Congress would actually be able to do it. But this is the reason he wanted to do it. He felt that he was trying to negotiate the end of the Civil War. And at the end of the Civil War, he felt that the South kept coming to him and saying, we are willing to maybe come back into the Union, but not if slavery is eliminated. And he wanted to be able to say in the negotiations, it's not up to me. Congress has already spoken, and the 13th Amendment has been approved by Congress. It'll be ratified by the states. So he wanted to try to take it out of his hands. 
And so ultimately, um, he used that as a reason, I think in his own mind, to get it approved and get it approved uh, relatively quickly. And so he spent a lot of time, and if any of you have seen the movie Lincoln, the movie Lincoln is really all about getting the 13th Amendment approved. Um, it is said that he was the most honorable man in the United States and the world, but he used the most dishonorable tactics to get it approved, and there's no doubt that he did some things that wouldn't look wonderful in the light of day, but he got the votes, um, they, they, the, Senate, the, the House ultimately approved it by two votes. Now why by two votes? Well, nobody wants to approve anything by one vote because one person can be blamed, you know, if you hadn't voted this way, it wouldn't have happened. So they, they approved it by two votes, eight members of the House didn't show up for the, election, for the vote, so they were absented on purpose. So you only need to have two-thirds of the people who voted, not two-thirds of the body. So some members didn't want to vote for it. They stayed away. It was approved. And then what Lincoln did is he was so excited when it was approved uh, on the end of January, January 31 of 1865, it ultimately was approved that what he did is he signed, uh, I think, 12 souvenir copies. Now, one of those souvenir copies, is, the originals is here, and it's signed by Abraham Lincoln. And when he signed something significant, he signed Abraham Lincoln, as he did in the Emancipation Proclamation as well. When he signed a regular thing, he just signed A. Lincoln. But the Congress of the United States passed a resolution admonishing him for signing it, because they said, you have nothing to do with, with uh, Constitutional Amendments. That's the Congress and the states, so get your hands out of this. So he signed him, and then he stopped signing, because he signed about 12 of them. But um, then, after it was signed, it then had to be ratified, and it took a while uh, to be ratified. It was the first state that ratified, actually on February 1, right the day afterwards, was Illinois. But you, it, and the question was, who has to ratify it? Do the southern states that withdrew from the Union, do they, are they part of the ratification process? Because it'd be harder to get them to ratify it. But his view was, yes, the southern states technically didn't withdraw from the country, in my view, and I would say that they have to ratify it. So um, they ultimately uh, did, and he got enough votes to ratify it. But however, he made a speech um, on April the, um, I think it was April 11th. Uh, uh, Robert E. Lee surrendered on, Robert, on, on April the 9th, 1865. On April the 11th, uh, outside the White House, he made a speech. In that speech, um, he kind of said something along the lines of, um, African Americans or freed people should have the right, those who are particularly intelligent or those who have fought for the United States should have the right, perhaps, to have certain civil rights and perhaps the right to vote. John Wilkes Booth heard that and he was so incensed that he said, I have to kill this man, and he did uh, three days later. So Lincoln didn't live to see the ratification of the uh, 13th Amendment. And any of you who have seen the movie, Lincoln, it was pretty accurate. Uh, the movie was based on Doris Kearns Goodwin's book on Lincoln. Um, she told Steven Spielberg she was going to write that book, and he said, I want to option it for a movie. She said, I haven't written it yet. Well, um, it took her 10 years to finish the book, but eventually scripts were written and all the scripts were thrown out because the scripts were all about the whole book, which includes all of Lincoln's life and, and, his, and life as a president. The ultimate script writer just took five pages of her book and made that the entire movie. And if you saw the movie, it is accurate. But there's one thing that's very interesting uh, in it. The, the place that's used as the U.S. Capitol was actually the Virginia State Capitol. So ironically, the head of the Confederacy, Virginia, was this place where they actually filmed uh, it as the U.S. Capitol. And then in the background of one of the pictures, there's a pic of the, uh, one of the scenes, there's a picture of a man who grew up in Virginia and is honored in the Virginia State Capitol. His name is Woodrow Wilson. His picture is in the background. Well, he wasn't alive at the time of the... Um, <laughs> but nonetheless, it's pretty accurate. And so... Um, so anyway, uh, Lincoln uh, signed these copies, and I own a few of them. One of these I will put uh, in, um, will be put in the new African American History and Culture Museum, which is opening on September the 24th in Washington, D.C., and I'm, I'm going to put on permanent loan one, one that's signed by Lincoln, and also I have a copy signed by Lincoln of the Emancipation Proclamation, which will also be put there. Uh, Lincoln signed the original, as I said, on January 1, 1863, uh, but he then signed 47 souvenir copies, which is, this is one, um, and now there are about 11 or 12 of them left, and I own a few of them, and so I'll put one there. And um, I think that, um, you know, it was a very simple document. It didn't really give any great rhetoric like the Gettysburg Address, and he wrote it very simply because he was afraid it would be overturned by the courts if he explained the reason. So it was very simple. One, one critic said it was just has all the grandeur of a bill of lading, which means it's very boring, but, but it, it did the trick. So. Um, those are the two uh, documents that are here, ultimately, as we all know, and I'll just conclude by saying, the 13th Amendment ended slavery, but it didn't really give blacks, freed blacks, any real rights. And so ultimately, there was the 14th Amendment, 
which said that there should be certain due process and equal protection of law, but that really didn't solve all the problems. And there was the 15th Amendment, which gave blacks the right to vote, or all people the right to vote. But to be honest, the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are nice on paper, but the Jim Crow laws grows in the South afterwards and really eviscerated much of the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. We didn't have slavery, but we had things close to it. And so not really until the 1960s, a lot of us have lived through it, and we had the Civil Rights Revolution, did we actually get closer to doing the kind of things that you know, we thought our country stood for and were embodied in the principles of the Declaration of Independence, even though we didn't really live up to those principles in the early days. So today, we still have the racial problems that I think are, were spawned by slavery, and they're not going to disappear overnight. Uh, we're still dealing with the residue of those problems, for sure. I think that the 13th Amendment, the Emancipation Proclamation, were steps along the way, but we still have a long way to go before we get to the kind of society that all of us want to have. Thank you. Um, Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely Thanks. brilliant. Time. Uh, Every time question left. I was going to ask you, you've answered. So I don't know what I'm going to talk to you about now. But all right, all right. Well, I, I'm sorry to disappoint you. I know you expected Suzanne Malvo, but I locked her in the green room. Well, and I'll be engaging you in a brief okay. conversation. All right. So I have about 15 minutes right, with you, and I'd like to hit on one or two points that you made in your talk, which was an absolutely okay. informative and enlightening talk. Thank you very much. And then I'd like to talk about what's going on in America now, from the 13th Amendment to now, both socially and politically. And then I'd like to have a brief conversation okay. with you about what's going on in the world. Okay. Today. But I want to start off, given my own love for manuscripts, could you tell us just a bit more about these two mm -hmm. very important documents mm -hmm. that we have here? And I want you to know that, as head of development, I'm more than happy right. to, to okay. take one of them from you, okay. given the many copies you have. All right. This is. <laughs> This is the Emancipation Proclamation. No, no, that's the, that's the 13th Amendment. This is the 13th Amendment. So how did you come to acquire these? Did they come to market? Is this Forbes' um, copy? Well, um, I, I went to an auction one time, mm -hmm. and they, they told me they were going to auction the next day the, the Magna Carta. And I said, how can you do that? It's supposed to be in England. But it turned out there are 17 copies of the Magna Carta, and uh, one was in private hands owned by Ross Perot, and it was up for sale. And, since it was the inspiration for the Declaration of Independence, the Bill of Rights, and so forth, I decided that one copy should stay in the United States, so I bought it. Was that the one that was on loan at the National Archives? Yes, and okay. it's now at the National Archives, and it'll be there forever. And as a result of that, I got into, people started calling me, well, if you want to buy historic documents, what about this and that? And it turns out there are rare copies of these documents that you can buy. I'm amazed that you can buy the Magna Carta. I think I spent... Uh, 20 some million dollars for it. 24 million dollars. Whatever it was. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, you know, if you want to buy a modern work of art, a contemporary work of art, you might pay $100 million for mm -hmm. work of art. It's, it's in, in Congress to me that you can buy the Magna Carta for a lot less than you can buy a work of art, but that's a separate issue. Um, I'd say, uh, so I began to get in, interested in, in acquiring some of these historic documents, but not to have them in my home. None of them are in my homes. Uh, they're all in places that people can see them. And this particular copy, mm -hmm. I, I'd lent to. Uh, President Obama it was in the Oval Office for several years. We took it down because it was beginning, it was going to fade after a while because of the, a lot of bright light there. But um, it, I put these in places that people can see them. So the State Department, the Smithsonian, the National Archives, um, um, and the Library of Congress, other places, so people can see them on the theory that if you see these historic documents, um, you might be more inspired to learn a little bit more about American history. And if you learn a little, bit, a, little bit more, more his, a little bit more about American history, maybe you'll be a better citizen. That's my theory, and I'm particularly concerned that Young people no longer are required to take civics courses. Uh, people know very little about our Constitution, very little about our history. So obviously, you can uh, see these on, on a video screen. But I think when you see the actual historic document itself, it does inspire people to maybe learn a little bit more than if they just looked at it on their, on their computer screen. And they're moving across the country, are they not? Well, I put them in very distant right. places, yes. This particular document uh, was, um, there are several versions of this. And, but the, the, the House passed it, the Senate passed it. And then members uh, passed it. Now, this was, I think, Schuyler uh, Colfax, who was the Speaker of the House, his version. And, and he and Lincoln signed it. And again, Lincoln was admonished for signing it because he was interfering with the rights of uh, members of Congress anyway. So, David, uh, the 13th Amendment. We, we've had an incredibly devastatingly sad couple of weeks here in the country, um, from Alton Sterling to Philando Castile, to Dallas, to Baton Rouge, uh, 
Uh, you're from Baltimore, and yet you're a long way from Baltimore, and yet Baltimore is looking more and more like the rest of America right now, given inequities and violence and poverty. How do we make sense out of all of this? Well, I, I don't think we can. I mean, I think, to be honest, as I was trying to say, we, we have eliminated slavery. We have eliminated um, some of the legal forms of discrimination, but we haven't really eliminated prejudice. And I'm not sure we're gonna eliminate anytime soon. And so we still have prejudice throughout our country. We still have many things that are completely in, in, uh, in, uh, antithetical to the beliefs that most people I hear, or everybody here believes in. But I, I, I think this is gonna go on for quite some time because you've got a situation where um, a lot of minorities, not only African-Americans, a lot of minorities have less education, mm -hmm. less, uh, lower, lower share of economic well-being, a higher percentage of, uh, in, in prisons, higher percentage in jails, uh, lower uh, percentage of literacy. So you can't expect to have everybody living together happily when you have people who are in jail, they can't read, they can't get jobs, they don't have economic uh, means. And so this is gonna be, go on for quite some time, uh, unfortunately. And while our country has so many wonderful things to offer, the, the, un the dirty underbelly of our country is this racial problem that we have. And it's not just racial, it's prejudice in other areas as well. Having a first black president, has that helped? Has that hindered us? The theory was that it would help, and I don't want to say it's hurt, but it's not clear today that we've made a lot of progress or as much as people thought we would make. Uh, that, that's clear. Mm. You know, in 1880, my grandfather's grandfather was a freed slave who went to a small town in Alabama, Montgomery, right on the outskirts, and they formed a community. They actually purchased a plantation in 1880, the Mays Plantation, and there aspirational commitment together right, collectively right. was that they could they could aspire to understand and appreciate the American dream, this idea of life, liberty, and the right. pursuit of happiness. Is the American dream at peril? Well, the, for people like me, I came from very modest circumstances, and I always believed that you could rise to the top by working hard and so forth, and perhaps some luck as well. I think what we found now is that we not only have an economic underclass, and obviously economic disparity is getting greater, not worse. It's the economic uh, inequality is greater now than any time since the late 1920s, and it's getting worse. That isn't the only problem. The problem is social mobility, because people at the bottom don't believe what I believe, that you can rise to the top. You can change your economic structure and, and, and well-being if you work hard and, get to, and, and do other things. Now I think people at the bottom don't think they can get to the top, and so the ability of people to get to the top or, the, or to the middle even is reduced. And I think the social mobility problem is as great as the economic inequality problem. And so I, it's not a, there's no in, easy solution. If anybody had an easy solution, they would have come up with it by now. This is going to take many generations of improved education and other kinds of things before we can really get to any place, place close to where we want to be. But right now, it's very disappointing uh, to see where we are in the, in the racial problems we've had over the last couple of years have brought home to people in this country that we haven't really solved the problems. You know, when John Kennedy ran for president in 1960, he was exposed to poverty and racial um, problems that he had never, been, had never seen before. It is said that the only black that he really knew was his valet before he ran for president. Mm -hmm. He just was really isolated. And even when he was president of the United States, he, would, he didn't really make a big push early on for civil rights legislation. But even the beginnings of the civil rights revolution in the early 60s and, and later um, really haven't changed dramatically the lives for so many people. It has made the lives of some uh, minorities much better, but not uh, as much as people thought it would be. And so therefore, legislation by itself obviously doesn't solve all the problems. So um, how can we answer these generational challenges in the midst of a very dysfunctional leadership apparatus here in this country? You know, if I had that answer, I would, I would give it to people. I'd run for office. I'd do something, but I... Well, hey, you can uh, run for I, office I, right I, now, let me tell I, you. Uh, but I, I don't, mm -hmm. there's no easy answer for it. And those of us, uh, in my case, I'm Jewish. Um, and if you're Jewish, you have had discrimination against you for thousands of years. Um, but in this country, uh, you could hide your religion if you wanted to, and it wasn't the same kind of discrimination you have because of the color of your skin. So Jews have been able to come from the bottom economic strata to the top economic strata and to be at the top of the society because maybe their skin color wasn't different than the, the ruling skin color of, of the majority of the population. 
but it's clear that, that uh, if you're an African American or Hispanic, you have a, a, a much greater uh, degree of prejudice you have to overcome. And I, I you know, look back on history, what we've tried to do in the United States is in a very important experiment which hasn't yet completely mm. worked. The experiment is this. It's to try to get people of different races to live together harmoniously without any prejudice and everybody is treated equally. If you go back over the last several thousand years in other civilizations around the world, it's very rare to find places where different ethnic groups came together and they were treated the same, different racial groups were, came together and were treated the same. What we're trying to do is what somebody really hasn't done before, or no country's really done, or that I know of, which is to have everybody, no matter what your background is, treated the same equally, and everybody has equal opportunities for education and, and, and fulfillment. We, we, we're trying to make progress. We've made progress since 1960, since 1860, since 1760, but we've got a long way to go. So, David, if our political systems are broken and not providing what we really need in order to become the good society, um, and we're all leaders here who are participating in this action forum, uh, then what is our challenge? Well, I think we should recognize that nothing will happen overnight, but we should try to get our uh, political leaders to be more sensitized to the problem. We should try to um, um, lobby them and, and be much more vocal about the need to provide better education, better training, better um, uh, voting opportunities for people who don't have those rights right now. And, you know, you can't expect somebody born into poverty uh, with, uh, uh, with not a uh, two-parent family to have the same advantages that somebody um, has who's born into a wealthy family with, uh, with two parents. And it's just, we have too many single-parent families now in the United States, for sure. And, um, you know, I don't think the situation is getting much better. When uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote his report in uh, 1960, talking about the the, the black family being, um, you know, having one parent family uh, very much in high Ill illegitimacy, um, people um, scoffed at him as a racist, but he actually was saying things that now we recognize mm -hmm. as true. And in our country, while you can argue that illegitimacy is a good or bad thing, it doesn't really mean that much difference, I think more than 50% of the people born in the United States today are not born of people who are wed together. So, you know, you can argue that, that maybe that's the wave of the future, but we have a large degree of illegitimacy in the United States. We have a large degree of dysfunctional families. We have a large degree of uh, violence against people, uh, domestic violence, uh, sexual violence. And in many ways, it seems like we haven't progressed as much as you would think we should have progressed after all the things we've done over the last 20, 30 years. We can send somebody to the moon, but we can't really live together peacefully. We can mm -hmm. invent the smartphone and, and the internet, yet we can't get people educated uh, so that in my, the city I live in, Washington, D.C., 25% of the people who enter high school don't graduate. And if you don't graduate from high school, the chances of your earning a very good income is much reduced. The chance of you going to the prison system in our country or jail system is much increased. And, you know, we have to take a very simple problem of literacy. It's hard to believe this, but 12% of the people in the United States are functionally illiterate. I mean, adults functionally illiterate, which means they can maybe sign their name, maybe they can read a stop sign, but they really can't read much more. And, and you can't expect a society to advance when 12% of the people are functionally, Ill are functionally illiterate. What about the current political campaign? Have you spoken to Trump? <laughs> I mean, this is, our concern is about the American enterprise. Are you not concerned? Well, I'm, you know, one of 320 million Americans, and I like to say that, uh, when we had seven, when we, in 1776, we had lots of problems. Uh, we only had three million Americans. 500,000 of them were slaves, and they weren't involved in the political system. One and a quarter million of those three million were women who weren't allowed to participate in the system. Um, and interestingly, we didn't allow uh, women to have the right to vote until this, to the 20th century, which is hard to believe. But we had one and a quarter million white men, almost all of whom were Christian. Uh, there may have been a few Jews floating around. They weren't given so many rights those days either. But you had one and a quarter million white men. And out of that one and a quarter million white men, you had George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, John Jay, among others. We now have 320 million Americans. And out of them, we have... <laughs> no, so, David, we I, have the... 
We have the Action Forum participants. That's what I, we have. So where are all these people? And I, I, my view is they've all gone into private equity. But um, <laughs> anyway. We're coming to the end of our time. Um, Brexit. Yes. Most of the supporters of Brexit now have kind of turned and went the opposite way. How do we make sense of this, and what are the implications? Well, one of the implications is you can't believe pollsters all the time. So um, we have developed polling in the United States pretty reasonably well. But remember, a lot of polling depends on people responding. And a lot of people um, don't respond to pollsters. And a lot of polling is done still through calling people who have stationary telephones. Remember what stationary telephone is? That's like in your house, and it's a landline. <laughs> well, how many people do you think are really still have landlines? A lot of people don't have landlines. And so polling has its inaccuracies. In the English uh, polling system is even worse, because there we saw that they, they thought that the last time the election was going to be very close, where Cameron won handily. So this time they clearly got it wrong. And I think what we should all say is that maybe uh, what we think about the next election in the United States could be wrong, too, because a lot of people may be afraid of saying what they really think to pollsters. Maybe the poll polling isn't that accurate. There's obviously a groundswell against establishments in England and in the United States, and so you don't know what the outcome is going to be. But in Brexit itself, I think will, um, I don't know 100% of what actually will happen. It will probably take a year and a half or two years for all the negotiations to, to occur. Um, I, I wonder, you know, whether it was a smart thing to say there should be a vote on it, because there wasn't a requirement that there be a vote. Um, I think David Cameron felt it might help him politically to say there would be a vote with his, within his own party, but it wasn't required, and, he, and there was no requirement that it be more than, uh, a, you know, say, majority. You know, democracy doesn't mean 50.1% always prevail. In our country, if you want to amend the Constitution, you need two-thirds of, of both houses and three-quarters of the states. So you have a higher uh, supermajority. If you want to get something done in the Senate, now you need 60 votes. So maybe, you know, they should have said, we either don't have the vote or we have the vote, maybe have 60 percent. Uh, you know, I have to wonder if Winston Churchill or Margaret Thatcher were prime minister of England and they had a 52-48 vote, would they say, I'm going to resign and I'm going to listen to exactly what the people said, even though they might have been misinformed? I don't know. I don't know exactly what they would do. I would say clearly they're struggling with it. Um, I don't know what will happen, but, but I suspect England will have a economic consequences that won't be good for the next year or so. And, I don't think it'll have a dramatic effect in the United States right away, but we don't know what the consequences will be uh, a year or two from now. So David, we have two minutes left, and this, this is the Resnick Aspen Action Forum, and there are about 100 youth in the room who've come here to engage in conversations to move thought to action. What is your last charge to us collectively as a group? Well, I think no one person is gonna solve any problem uh, that we've talked about tonight. I think in Walter's book, The Innovators, uh, Walter pointed out that even the great uh, in, in, uh, inventors of our, uh, in our history of people who invented the internet and the cell phone and computers, nobody did it by himself or herself. They did it in teams. And generally, uh, I think we're gonna have to recognize that no one person here is gonna solve all these problems. I think working together, we can do a lot more than we can individually, but I think what individuals, young people should do is recognize that they should try to take advantage of the opportunities they have to learn, to read, to meet people, to make contacts, and to try to aspire to do something useful with their life. Um, we're all on this planet for a relatively short period of time. Homo sapiens have been on the planet for roughly 200,000 years, and each of us is given the right to live between, let's say, if you're fortunate, 70 to 100 years or so. But 100 years out of 200,000, relatively short period of time. And that 100 years, you don't have a uh, chance to do too many things, and you only have a limited period of time to do something. But everybody wants, when they get to the latter part of their life, to say, I've done something useful for humanity. I've made the world a better place than when I, when I found it. And so you want to make your parents proud, your children proud, yourself proud. You think you've done something useful. So all, to the, all the young people, I'd say, you know, take care of basic necessities, get a good ed education, get a decent job, but try to f find something that you can do that makes at least your part of the world better and maybe ultimately it'll lead to something better for the whole world. So don't keep your ambitions too low. Set your sights very, very high and ultimately money, one of you or maybe many of you will turn out to be somebody who actually solves some of the problems that I've talked about tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you David. Okay. Thanks. Uh, Thank you. Besides actually having read Walter's book, The Innovators, which We'd like to thank you for your example on good citizenship and what it means to step up.
Thank you very much. We're now about to view a film called He Named Me Malala, and it's being underwritten by the Skoll Foundation. So I invite you to stay in the room and to prepare for the film. <laughs> 